All right, well, I, I recommend then uh, we go ahead and get started and let people uh, join us um, in the flow of the meeting. Um, we can maybe maybe towards the end, uh, based on how the group forms, we can we can do some quick introductions at the, the end of the meeting. Um, but Pascal, if you want to uh, go ahead and start sharing your desktop and uh, start uh, telling us about Docker. Thank you. So can you see my console? I can. Is it big enough, the, the, the font and everything? It is. Great. So, and can you see my browser? I can. Perfect. And so I think we start right, right, right ahead. Um, if you have any questions which are important for understanding, please ask them right now. If you have further questions, I would kindly ask you to delay them till the end of my presentation because I have one hour to explain Docker and I think that's uh, not a lot of time to do that. So I think many of you have heard of Docker in the last years. It's, it's, it's a, so, uh, a tool that is spoken a lot of. And um, since I, I think until maybe three months ago, I heard a lot of it. I had a rough idea what it is, but I didn't look into it. And I'm afraid that many people does have the same problem. So I would like to start with a little um, introduction really into Docker, what it is, what it does. So if you already know a lot about, about Docker, I'm sorry, but I think it's, it's important for, for many other people here. Um, I will come later and, and demonstrate how I use Docker with DSpace. So that may be interesting for everybody who knows Docker quite well already. Um, Docker itself is a, is a, is a tool to um, easily build and run containers. And um, before we look into what a container is, I would like to, to start with an image. So an image is some executable package that includes everything to run one application. And the important point on this is that it's once one application. So one application per container is something that you have, should have in mind always when working with Docker. So in case of DSpace, for example, we have um, normally some solid container and we have some database and maybe you use DSpace RDF and then for the linked data stuff, you might need, um, you might need the, um, the triple store. So you might run multiple services. And if you do this, you should use one container per service and not put all together into one, one container. Um, I come later to explain why, but so the basic idea is um, you have an image and an image contains everything you need to execute one program, one application, one service. A container itself is nothing else than um, a one-time instance of an image. So you have this, this image that does, um, contains, for example, a database for DSpace, and the container itself is a running image in the memory of your computer, of your host system that, that's running the image. So um, I, have, I, I took out some images from the DSpace documentation, the public one to explain this a little bit better. Um, could you please give me a short audio feedback if I'm still hearable and everything is fine? Still sounding good. Great. So what you see here is the basic idea of, of containers. You, you have your host system, which is running normally on, on, on Linux, so it, it runs a kernel, and directly on top of the kernel, you have the containers. And the containers, um, they contain one application with a full stack. So it doesn't run a complete second version of, of Linux. It only runs the, the libraries and binaries that are needed um, for the application you're running on top of it. Um, I would consider that, for example, what you see here already a bad example, because what you have here is you have the database and the PHP application on the same container, and I would um, tend to um, put them into two separate containers, um, mainly for security reasons, but that's something we come in a minute to. Um, the great point on containers is that you um, put everything you need to run it in the image and that you can transfer the image to another machine, to another developer, to another directory that you have packed everything together, what you need for your, for your application. And that it's really easy to spin up a new container from an existing image or even to build images. So containers gives you something that um, is really portable, that is scalable. You can put 
another containers while running an application um, and, and vertica, vert, vert, vertically um, um, scale the application if you need more instances of it running on, on other services, for, on other computers, for example. You can hand out your images to other developers. So for example, if, um, if we would create, or we already did, but if somebody would like to start with DSpace, they could use uh, our Docker images and could, um, and if they know Docker a little bit, they could easily get a, get a running DSpace installation um, without having to look into the manual, how to install DSpace, what all the things, all the dependencies of DSpace are to install a database or anything. They just take the images and say to their local Dockers, please run these images. So um, that was really helpful. My use case is the one of a DSpace service provider. So I'm, I'm building up the library code, a uh, young, rather small, growing DSpace service provider in Germany. And I'm working for multiple clients. So I have to support multiple versions of DSpace with different configurations, plugins, features, local needs, and so on. And um, to do that, I have to switch between different installations of DSpace while developing uh, in my daily work often. So it's really helpful for me if I can put everything um, that I need for one instance into some kind of um, bundle, package, archive, whatever, put it away when, when I start to work for another client for, for, for a couple of hours or some days, and then come back to, to, to the client I was working before, for example, and just unwrap everything as, as I left it. So it's not that I have just one repository and I'm, I have my development um, version of this repository in my machine. I'm, I'm working on multiple repositories basically all of the time. Um, I'm working as a committer, so um, from time to time I'm, I'm looking into bug fixes and need a vanilla D space to work on it, or I, I want to test some, some pull requests and, and want to put them on, on, a, on a vanilla D space. So one of my use cases is to be able to really easily start a new instance of D space, to come back to an instance of D space I was working on before, and that is something where Docker really helps me a lot. Um, what I need to work to, to really do the work is um, while I love, for example, VI, I use VI um, basically every day. I'm not coding in VI. I really use IDEs heavily because they make especially um, development in Java much more easier, I think, and much more faster. So um, I, I'm using an IDE and what is important for me is that the code I'm working on is available for the IDEs at once on my on my on my laptop. So um, I, um, when I started to work on DSpace, I was working for one university only and only had one instance. And I had my Tomcat locally and my source code locally, and all went well and was easy to to use. But then when I started to have multiple instances running in parallel. Um, I first started to think about virtualizing them. So for example, putting them into, into virtual box. And I had the problem then that the source code always had to be moved, um, for example, via Git or had to be copied to the virtual machine. And um, so I needed the local access to develop it. And so I often had a lot of files to transfer to sync to not forget something and to keep track of the state the different folders with the, with the source code could have. Um, that was not really use, useful, so I came back and, and was continuing to work with, with one local installed Tomcat only, but then you always have to switch between the, the web apps that are deployed, undeploy them, deploy other ones, or you have to live with a Tomcat that really needs, needs a long time to start, and that was not fine either. Then um, Hadi Pottinger and Pottinger and, and other people Tim Donahue, for example, also worked on, on Vagrant, DSpace Vagrant, and I started to use it. And it was really helpful because it was possible to mirror the DSpace source code folder and still have um, virtual boxes that were spin up mostly automatically. I always run into one flaw with, with DSpace Vagrant that it was hard if you installed it once to install it a second time because it then sometimes forgot to get the DSpace source code folder from GitHub. So um, that was always a little bit hard to catch. And the other problem was when you were using one source code folder on your host system and on the virtual box, 
that it, the virtual box became quite slow. So um, compiling there took much more time than doing it just locally. Three months ago or four months ago, I started to, to play around a little bit with Docker and, and was looking into it. And basically for me, it does much of the things I loved on Vagrant, but is much more performant on it. And if we are looking, for example, on the difference between containers and virtual uh, VMs, so what we have here is we have um, the host OS, in my case, it's Mac OS, but it could also be a Linux or Windows. Then there's the Docker running on it. On the Docker, there's running the application, uh, the, the, the binary libraries, and then on top of it, the application. And in my case, normally I run two containers all of the time. One is running Postgres and the other one is running DSpace and it would be easy to spin up a third container with a triple store, for example. If we're looking on virtual machines, it looks a little bit different because what the virtual mach machine is doing is, so in my case, the infrastructure is my local um, operating system. Then on top of it, there's a hypervisor. So that's almost the same as with Docker, but then there's another complete operating system with a kernel on its own, with all the stuff on its own, and then the binaries and application is coming. So what Docker strips off actually is this layer here. So the difference between these two images just shows that um, the layer of the guest operating system, whoops, sorry, that was one image too far. The layer of the guest operating system is gone. And that really, helps to, 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 to make the things much more faster. Um, let me take a look on my notes to not forget anything. Yeah, so what you can do actually, and what a lot of people are doing when, when they're running to, uh, um, on Docker in a productive system. So I'm using it currently only for development. I plan to use it for productive systems, but I haven't done yet. And what you often see in productive systems is that they, one Docker inside of virtual machines. I don't know about the performance of it, but I know that um, this is done a lot outside, so I expect it to be fine um, for most of the things and most of the people. The idea is that separating applications into containers on their own is a security reason. So if somebody is able to um, break into your uh, Data triple store, for example, he shouldn't have access to the database or the DSpace application. And in case of DSpace, the triple store contains only data that's publicly available. It's just readable for everybody, so there's no problem with it. But the database, for example, also contains some personal information that shouldn't be readable to, to anybody outside and anybody who's not an administrator. So it's a separation of concerns. Of course, if you have security fixes in your database or in DSpace that may bring other problems, but unless, as long as it's only the triple store, for example, you would be a little bit more safe than running all together on one machine. Um, I would like to go directly into my command line interface. So what I'm doing a lot, I'm, I'm, I love my keyboard and I love to work with the, with the command line. And um, uh, I prepared something, here we go, let me clear this. So what you see here is I, I created a little um, folder just for the show and tell for today. And I put into this folder for, um, I put four folders into this. Um, basically these the folders, sorry. Yes, this one can go away. This is empty and we don't need this one. But the other one contains two Docker containers and one DSpace host directory. Yeah, just IntelliJ, okay, I leave it. it, it was created automatically by IntelliJ, so I leave it where it is and we can talk about it later. Um, let's look into, into a, a container for, uh, into, the, into the Docker part of, of the, the stuff we have here. What you see here, is a, a folder that contains everything that Docker needs and um, to run my DSpace. And what it basically needs is, is a Docker file. So um, the Docker file is the recipe, I would call it, to create the image, image I was running. And at the beginning of the meeting, I told you that the image is the package for, that contains everything we need to run the application. So let's look into the Docker file. Um, the first line is really important because it tells you that I'm starting from another existing Docker container outside. So 
Here I'm starting from Ubuntu Xenial, so from, from the later LTS. I think it would be totally simple to upgrade to the new Ubuntu version, to the new LTS that just came out, just by changing um, uh, this file to, to, to the new Ubuntu. And then I could leave everything else and it would spin up by DSpace probably, expecting that OpenJDK 8 is still available and that DSpace plays well with the versions of um, these packages that are in the new uh, Ubuntu release. We can try this later if you want to, but this shows you already that it's totally simple if you're working with Docker to change little things and spin up new machines on, on new basics, on new grounds. The second thing that you see here is um, that I run one large command that basically installs packages within Ubuntu that I, I think I could need. And, um, that I create my locals and at the end, I'm making a little cleanup. So I come to the reason why I do this in one command and to the cleanup uh, in a minute, but just be aware of it for the moment. Let's take a look on the, on the, father, on, on the father file. So I'm, I'm creating some environment variables and so on. And what you already can see is there's a run command in Docker. There's a from command, we talked about it. There's a run command that just executes a command in the virtual machine, it's not a virtual machine, in the container basically already, in the, or in, in the build process of the image. Then you see that I create some environment variables. Um, I tell um, Docker a rich directory in the container, it should continue to work. And that basically is all you need to, to spin up a D space. So um, one copy is maybe another important uh, um, com um, 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 command that allows me to copy files from my local environment into the container. So the files that were copied here are the files that are lying around here. And let's take a look to uh, two of them and you will understand what I want to do there. So if we take a look on the bash aliases and the bash history, um, you see that, I'm, that I've prepared some commands that I want to have in my history. So I can, can use them by searching my history for commands like you, you always do in bash, or that I want to have some commands with aliases. So this helps me to use my Docker instance right away because what I'm doing often is I'm building a completely new machine. It's completely empty, was never used before, new, new container, was never used before. So to get up right away and right fast, I thought it's a good idea to have something um, looking like I was using this one before. Uh, Terry, can you still hear me? I can. Great. Yeah, and screen share is working well too. We've got uh, a few people who've joined us, so thanks for uh, joining in. Cool. So I will give you in a moment a possibility to ask the next questions. Um, just let me get back to the to the to the to the Docker file. So what you what we also already saw was the from command, the run command, and the copy command. And basically, these. Um, almost all of the commands you need to create a container. Um, there are some more and also helpful ones, so it's, it's worth to look in, in, into the, the manual, but for the start, it's, it's quite a simple system. You know, you just imagine you have an empty Linux box, either a container or a virtual machine, and want to bring a DSpace onto it. So what you do is you install the, the requirements, you um, Download a Tomcat and put it into some 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 folders. So I'm installing my my Tomcat here to um, I'm, I'm unwrapping my Tomcat in the in the temp file and, and later I'm I'm moving it to use a local Tomcat. Um, I'm copying some 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 configuration into my con, con, uh, um, Tomcat and putting it to Catalina Home, and um, I'm creating a DSpace folder where where I want to install the DSpace and one where I want to have the DSpace source code file. I'm copying, as I showed you, my bash history, my bash aliases, my configuration for uh, Vim and screen and, and, and stuff like this. I'm creating the user that, that will run the DSpace. So we just have here a run command um, that is um, really writing the user directly into the, 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 the system configurations where, where it is needed. So I think you could also use an add user command here that was basically copy paste from another Docker file and works really great. So I don't have a reason to change it. And then at the end, um, I'm telling the, the Docker to change the running user to developer. So the user that is, that will run the DSpace. 
So I don't want to work as root all the time. So go back to, to, to developer and then go to my working directory. What misses here is normally a Tomcat, uh, normally a Docker container runs a command. And as long as this command runs, the Docker container exists. And as soon as this command um, stops running, the Docker container will be removed and, and put away. And normally what you would expect here is that the Docker container spins up the DSpace for you. So um, puts the DSpace sources into it, compiles them and starts the Tomcat. And as this is a development machine, I'm not doing this right here because I'm recompiling often and I want to have um, the full control on the machine all of the time. And I'm running the control like I'm normally working on my local machine. But for a productive system, for example, I would expect that it starts the Tomcat already. So what we already saw is that I'm copying files into the container. This is done, for example, with the configuration files. But we have files that change while the co container is running. So the DSpace source folder, it's just a symbolic link. That's why it's, it's colored, another, another color here. But if we look into it, it's just the DSpace source code folder as you know it. And when I start my IntelliJ, So when I start my IntelliJ, it starts, um, it, it works directly on the source code folder. So if I change something in the IntelliJ, um, it will be changed directly in this source code folder. And I want this change to be transferred to Docker directly. And what we use in Docker is we have, um, so I mentioned that when the command or the service that Docker is running stops, the whole container is removed. And with the whole container also, all the files are removed because what we want to have is we want to have images that spins up always again and again as they should look like. And we don't want to keep the state that was achieved after running the application normally because I don't, I don't for example, if, if, my, if, if I change some configuration files from my Tomcat to check some, I don't know, crazy cool IDE, and I want to come back to my normal state. I don't want to keep the state. I want to be able to transfer the image before and know that somebody else who got the image is working on the same state as me. So every time I spin up a Docker commander, it's, it's spinning up the image as it was before it, it runs the last time. So to keep, um, to keep um, files also, we have two possibilities. One possibility is called volume. A volume is something that Docker controls for you and it's, some kind of a persisted folder in your container. So for example, um, I have another Docker file, which is much simpler. Let's take a look to it. Then it's, it's, it's easier to explain. Um, here I have a Docker file that contains everything for my Postgres. That is everything that I need to run a Postgres in Docker. It tells my Docker to get the latest image that Postgres itself is providing to Docker Hub. And then it installs Piggy Crypto, it, it, it copies some, some shell script to it, um, and that's it. And it's copying the shell script to a folder that is explained in this um, Docker image. So we can take a look on the Docker image to see what it's doing. I'm coming back to the, to the, to the volumes in a minute. So on hub docker.com, you can find a lot of images that other people wrote for you and are providing for you, for example, the Postgres image. And here you find some references and some information that tells you which environment variable to change if you want to achieve something and where you can put files that should be run when the container is installed or is started and so on, so on, so on. And after reading this, I understood, or somebody else did, that uh, putting this into this folder makes it run. And if we look into it, we can see what it does. Basically, um, it starts the PostgreSQL user, it creates a, a schema extension, a schema named extensions, and in the schema it uh, installs the Piggy Crypto library, and then it's altering the database DSpace, I don't know for what search, uh, or it's altering the, the search path, path to include this um, created um, schema, and it creates um, usage to, to, to the Postgres user. So that's everything it does. And when I spin up this container, it starts the Postgres and it runs the script and everything is done. But the problem is that in my 
um, that my files, the PostgreSQL database, used to persist the change in the, in, the, in the database, they would be lost as soon as the database stops. And that's something that is not really available. I want my database to be secure. So when I run my database, um, when I run my database, that's what's happening here. So we have the PostgreSQL. When I run my database, I'm telling him, hey, come on, use a volume. So PG data, the, the directory PG data, please put this, so the directory PG data on my host system, right directly beside this file, which I'm explaining in a minute. Please mount this into the, the container under, under var lit PostgreSQL data. So what it does then is that it persists this folder and we can look into this folder. PG data, so it contains another folder of PG data, and within there, there are all the files the database needs to be run. Pascal, so if the container, Pascal we cannot yes. see the bottom line of your terminal, so we don't. See, at least I can. Okay, so then we continue like this. Better like this? Yeah, that's great. Cool. So. What you see here is all the files that the PostgreSQL database was putting, in, was putting into the container. And when the container is removed, these files are persisted. And when I start a new container, it will find these files and the PostgreSQL data will contain everything that it did before. So to persist, persist something in a container, you need volumes. And there's another mechanism um, beside volumes. That is what I showed with the DSpace source folder. It's called Bound, bind mounts, so it, it's mounting a folder from my host system into my container. So the DSpace source code folder, this one here, it's running on, on, on my host system. If I take a look on it, that's what we have in here. And I'm changing to another bash script that is running directly in the container. That's the container after spinning it up. And if I look here, I'm under services, DSpace source, and there I have the source code file that mounted in here. So if I create a test file, for example, in here, here you can see the test file. And if I go back to my host system and take a look into the source folder, you see the test file appears here. And the same works in the other direction. I can remove this file. So that works. Um, so, if you want to persist something in a container, you need volumes and you need bind mounts. And a volume is always a bit faster than, than the bind mounts because the bind mounts need to put the stuff also, to make the stuff also available on the host container. But um, um, the bind mounts is something you cannot directly access from the host container. So it depends on what you need. I could have put the PostgreSQL database, for example, also only in a, in a volume, so it wouldn't appear on the host system, and it would still persist. Um, for the last few months, I didn't have a reason to do so. It was always fast enough, and I found it agreeable to see, and for example, to be able to remove my PostgreSQL database just by wiping out the, the, um, the bind bar, or just by wiping out the files in the directory on the host system. There was a lot of information for the start. The next thing I would show to you is how this all works up and works together and just give you a feeling how I work with it. Before I do that, do you have any questions? Uh, can you hear me? Well, uh, uh, yeah, where, where is this on GitHub? <laughs> so the version I'm running here is not directly on GitHub, but the version I started from, and I will make my version also available, of course, but um, I just was missing the time to, to, to clean it up and put it out. And I don't will be able to do it before open repositories, I'm afraid of. But there's a really pretty good version running on GitHub already. So if you go to the DSpace organization on GitHub, so github.com slash DSpace. Um, where is it? We have in DSpace labs, we have um, a whole, uh, we're, we've started to build up a collection of Docker images. Yeah, we have this too, but let me show first, sorry, exactly it's on DSpace Labs already, also the other one. Let me first show the old version because the other ones we are still working on, I think, Terry. So um, we have here the Docker images. We can take a look into this in a minute. 
And we also here, DSpace Dev Docker. So it's something that another person started a long time ago. I already pushed some, some commands to it, I see. And um, that's already where you can start from and already explaining a little bit what you can do and how you launch things and so on. So to give you the URL again, uh, github.com slash dspace dash labs slash dspace dash dev dash docker. And what Terry just mentioned is we started to put out a lot of Docker files and to work on this together, also on dspace labs, on dspace Docker images. And what we want to do is to put out different Docker files for different use cases. So for example, dspace dev, maybe we should just copy the other stuff over here um, later today, Terry. Um, but dspace dev for development, for example, dspace angular, um, that's something I think I could contribute right away also to. Um, for the Angular part of DSpace 7, Code Envy is something that uh, Terry, I don't know, talked about already or will talk about in a, in a uh, show and tell. Um, Oracle is something that uh, Tom Desire will talk about later. DSpace Tomcat is something that will be useful to, to run a DSpace in production one, time, one day. But that's all work in progress and not done yet. And then four of these images that are in here, and, and they're not clearly uh, shown on this page, have actually been published to Docker Hub. So you can just pull from dspace slash dspace postgres and pull down the image. So anyway. Um, yeah, so, so uh, thanks. And I think this is great. And if you have the time, I think it makes a lot of sense to have this stuff in one location. Yeah, I think we should just move the, the dspace dev, um, docker dev right into this folder if, if Terry agrees. I don't know yeah. how much time and what you, what you did for the docker file, Terry, but, but maybe that would be the right place to, to, put, to just move sure, it. We can, we can talk about it when, you, when we... Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just Great. digress. Great. So let's say this is a work in progress part of it, but there you, you, we, we at least will, will put all the information to the readme file um, within the next week, I think. If you look on, 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 on hubdocker.com for dspace, you find a lot of dspace stuff and a lot of stuff from people I do not know, which is really interesting because I think that I know many of the developers working with dspace and it's interesting who's already working with dspace and Docker and we do not know about them. And also images that are pulled quite frequently. So a lot of people were looking into this already before us. I think there was another question from somebody else. Yeah, I was wondering um, how do you manage the file permissions if you mount the, the volume? So the file permissions um, are basically managed by Docker itself. Um, what you have to manage, of course, are the files permission when creating the, uh, the image. Or wait, so it's a Docker file. So if you look here, for example, in the Docker file, you will find some parts where I'm changing file permissions to the user I created and I'm working with. And later I run this user command and this tells Docker that everything that happens from this point on will be run with the rights from this user. So when I connect to my Docker, it starts a bin bash with the rights of this user. And I think that's also the information that Docker needs to know under which file permissions it should mount the volumes, but I'm not totally sure about that. So um, basically- Because I had some issues if like, if the, the user on my host system does not have um, UID 1000, yeah. then um, things are harder because then Docker creates files that belong to a user that is not you and then it's... So I have UID 501 and it works great. Okay. And I never, I, I never was thinking about it. Yeah, so maybe they fix it in the meanwhile. <laughs> Probably. They're, they're, they're pretty well, pretty fast working on it. So I think every three months or every half year, there's a new version with new features and new bug fixes and everything. That's, they are doing a lot of it, a lot of versions. Any other questions? So let's, let's spin up a Docker file. I think that, that's the thing we are mostly waiting for. Let's, let's create, let's build an image. And if you have questions, you can, you can interrupt me all the time. Um, the problem with Docker is, that you create command lines that are awfully long if you want it manual, manually. And to make this easier, there's something that's called Docker Compose. 
basically the idea was, I told you that you should run one service per container. So for example, for DSpace out of the box, DSpace 6, I'm using two containers already. For DSpace 7, I probably will use three containers. One for the Angular um, user interface, one for the REST API and, and all the, the, um, the stuff in the background and one for the database. So if you have to run up multiple containers, you normally have to bring them up in the right order. They have to be able to, to talk to each other, to access each other and so on and so on. And you have to, these, these bind mounts and volumes to bring into to tell Docker what to use. And so you create even long command lines. And as people was annoyed by this, somebody came up, especially for stacking several services into one file with Docker Compose. And Docker Compose is an easy file that just describes the command line that you should be running to start this, this Docker file. I will resize the image of my terminal again a little bit so we see the whole file. And um, what you see here is I'm defining services which I will run. And in this file, I'm defining two services, one Postgres and one DSpace dev. And then I'm telling him in which folder or in which working directory he should one to, to build this file. So the Postgres folder, we were in this before. I'm opening up a new window to show you the contents. Um, so my Postgres folder, we, we had this contains this Docker file and the install PG crypto shell. And what it does is it moves, it, it changes the directory into this Docker file and then it runs Docker build. And if we would run Docker build on the command line over there, it would do exactly the same. So let's do this for a moment. Docker build. Sorry, I forgot the dash. Docker build in this directory. And it starts to run and it takes the images, image from, from Docker Hub, it copies my files into it, and the, the image is built. I can have a look on all the images. Don't be afraid, but there will be a lot of images in my machine because I was working like hell in the last, last week with, with Docker for several things. And you also see here that they have, starting with some smaller ones to bigger ones, I'm coming to this in a minute, not all of them even have names for several reasons. Um, but building this Docker file here, as you saw, it was really easy and quick. If you do the same here, we saw the Docker file for DSpace is much longer. It starts to build it and tremendously fast. And it's so fast because it has cached all the stuff that we were doing here. I'm running this with another command, no cache. And that is the moment where I stop to use Docker directly and I will use this compose file that I showed to you. Because if I'm running Docker compose build, it will run, it will build all the Docker files I need to run DSpace. So the Postgres one and the DSpace one. And I set them, run it without the cache. So what it's doing now is, you see it, it runs app get update, app get install, and then it grabs all the, the packages and it's installing them and so on and so on and so on. This takes a couple of time. And um, so here we go. And if we look, I let it run in, the, in, another, in another window, it's over here. And we take a moment to look into the Docker file so I can explain you what's happening, how the cache is working. What you have here is you have one Docker command and another Docker command and another Docker command. And after every Docker command, it's making such an image. So at the point here, it's making an image that has no name on my system. And when I run the Docker build command for a second time, it checks with checksums and with modified dates and so on and so on, if the command in the cache is still up to date with my Docker file. If I change something in the Docker file, which we will do in a minute, so for example, if I change the order of two commands, it will start to run, um, it, it will notice that, for example, until this point, it has everything in the cache and that's correct, and then it will start the command up from here. So you don't have to rebuild all the stuff. So what's taking a long of time, basically, is to install, um, all the packages to install the Apache and so on and so on. If I change something further below, it's running much faster. 
It also shows you all the time that in my Docker file, I have 33 steps to run. And um, then I have 33 steps to run. And um, that it, oh, how, how much it already ran. So that is what it's doing to, to build this file without the cache. If I'm running it again, I remove the no cache. You see it, it will be there immediately. It just checks if something changed in the Docker file, didn't, so it works well. And um, for example, let me go to the end of the file and change one of the last commands. Um, we shouldn't change these, but we just changed the order of these two copy, copy commands. If I'm running it again, it just goes fast to step 20, uh, 25 and then it starts really to run these steps. So it's taking the image it created before the step 25 and then it's going on. And that is really agreeable if you have to change something because you don't have to grab all the depth packages all the time again and again. But if you want to have a clean, completely new system, you just run it without the cache, you get all the newest files and everything is fine too. So what I did basically is I built the Docker files. The only thing that we are still missing is to start them. And I'm starting them with Docker Compose. So let's take again a look into the Compose file. I explained to you what the build command does. We are mapping ports so I can access, so that the Docker, um, the different Docker containers can have access to each other. So the DSpace Docker needs access to the, to, the, to the Docker where the database is running. And that also I can access it from my machine on. So I'm telling it uh, on my machine is this port on the, and connect it to the, to the container on this port. I'm setting some environment variables. And that is really helpful. And I was working last week for DSpace Angular to be able to configure two important parts of DSpace Angular by environment variables because this is how you can change it for everyone. You don't have to change the Docker file. You don't have to build the container and change it then. You can just tell them, okay, my environment, environment variables are these, build my Docker container, run it, and there it is. And if you wonder why I was using so much time to look for the environment vari variables, because I, can, I want to be able to change the point where the, uh, the, 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 West AP, the West endpoint, for example, within the environment variable, within my Docker Compose YAML file. It creates the volumes, it's telling that it uses a TUI, and that's it. And below here, it's running the DSpace development machine, it builds it, um, adds some, 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 some ports, so 8080 and 8000, adds support for the remote debugger. I want the remote debugger to be only available on my host system and not from the other containers, for example. Um, so I put in here a, a bind to, to um, my, my loopback device. It depends on the, on the Postgres that has to be on before. And um, it has one environment variable that is not needed for the moment, but was in the other file. Create some volumes and that's basically it. So let, let us run this one. Um, I think it's over here open. Docker compose up. And I say him to detach because it's running multiple containers and um, it should run them in the background. So I have an error, it tells me that uh, the ports I want to bind are already in use because in preparing the session, I was running a Docker com, uh, uh, another Docker machine. Um, I think it's within here. I have to stop this one before. I'm really thinking about making an alias. Um, I'm always forgetting the dash. So I stopped this machine, so my ports are free now because if I want to bind something to a port on my host machine, the, the port on my host machine has to be available, of course. And now I can start our Docker container here again. And there we are. All I did, it started the Docker container with Docker PS. You can see the running Docker containers with Docker PS dash A. You see all the containers in the background that are not running currently, but still exist. Um, what I want to do now is to access my DSpace dev, I'm never accessing the Postgres. I don't have any reason to access this. If I want to use it, I start my PG admin on my host machine, or I start a PSQL client from, from the development machine. I'm including it in my IDE. But I'm accessing really often the dev machine. And to do this, I have this nice command, execute, docker execute, docker exec. 
Minus IT, it tells them that I want to have an interactive terminal and tells them the name of the machine. So the name is uh, this one. I have to copy this over there because so I was running another machine before. And then I tell him to start my bash. And what I get here is a Ubuntu container. It's not a virtual machine, it's a container that contains my DSpace already. It contains an empty folder where I want to install the DSpace. So I would have to run Maven package. I could put this into the Docker files and building the image would take longer. And um, for a productive system, that would make sense. But for a development system where the source code changes often, I want to change the source code all the time and don't want to have it in my, in my Docker file, so it's not in here. Compiling DSpace takes a little bit of time, so I don't want to do this now. I have a machine ready for us to use, um, so I'm switching back over again. There are two commands I can use to stop the running machine. The Docker Compose stop just freezes it, and with start, it goes off on again at the point where I stopped it. So for example, if I connect to the machine and within a container, within the container in a, in a directory that is not bind mounted or not on a volume, I create a, a test file again. So you see here this test file. If I run docker compose stop, it stops my container. It's not running anymore. I start it again. Connecting back to it. You see my bash history is there. The test file is still there. It just froze the container and uh, um, unfroze it when I told him to start again. And then there's another com command, it's docker compose down. That's really removing all the container. So it's stopping and it's removing it. Up dash D, so as we did before, spin up the container, uh, spin up the image, create a container from this image to it in the background. Um, takes a little bit longer than just starting, executing it. If I look into my bash history, it contains only the stuff that I put into my bash online history file, not the ls command I was running. If I'm looking in my home, com uh, home folder, the test file is gone because as I said, Everything in the container is only persisted if it's on a volume or bind mount. So the test file is gone. And actually for me, this is pretty good because I know what it's persisting and I know I have a really simple way to spin up a completely clean runtime environment for DSpace. I have 10 minutes left and I'm almost at the end, but I want to show you the running version of it, of course. So we stop or we even put down the one container that has no compiled stuff into it and we go into dspace dev docker. So what I did here, before I was just running Maven, so we have everything already. And also for the dspace install directory, I put it onto a, a bind mount, so something, I have here bind bound dspace build, and this I have the compiled dspace line, so that I, if I put down the container and bring it back up, I don't have to run Maven again all the time. And I can also access it from my host system if I have any, any use case for that, if I need it. I have to look up the image name. Um, There we go. So when I connect to a virtual machine, I often have the problem that the bash in the, in the in, when I connect to a container, not to a virtual machine, into the container, I often have the problem that the bash for some reason don't get the interrupt that's saying that the window size changed. So I always changing, changing the window size at the beginning until I found the bug and fixed it, not yet. I love to run screen, so virtual terminals within my container. On one screen, I'm putting the log file. I spin up the DSpace before. On the other one, I'm, I'm working. So let's take a look if we have a running uh, Tomcat. Shouldn't be there because I just started the container. There's nothing, you see the, 
the tail that looks into the, the, the log files, and you see the grab, and Tomcat start starts by Tomcat. So the alias command and the Tomcat command are both aliases that you that makes it easier just to use it. Here you find the, the, the log command, and over here we have the Tomcat that just tells him move to the directory where it's, where it's installed. You saw this environment variable was set in the Docker file, and then the Catalina.sh. So moving back to the virtual command where my console is running, and we see here that my uh, Tomcat started up. And now I can connect to the Tomcat that is running on my virtual machine. I have, have the Tomcat and this, the, the manager app and everything, or I can go into my DSpace installation, which is over here. And if I want to change something now, um, so within this virtual machine, I told Tomcat to run my JSP UI from the target of my DSpace source folder. And I'm doing this like this because um, when I change a JSP file in my IDE, it's directly changed also in this directory and also put onto the container. So I can work on my, um, in my normal source folder, changing JSP files that immediately directly put to the point where, where Tomcat uses them. I don't have to copy them back to my source folder. I'm not working in the, in the binary, um, in, in, in the install directory. I'm working in a directory that is used by my IDE and um, where my IDE keeps it up to date. So we can If we go in here, for example, home JSP, so we have here the, the DSpace layout and um, Maybe it's the browser crash. Oh. I did not want to write an email to it. I just wanted to open the the build extensions. Yeah, there we go. Because that switches off my cache. Don't seeing the stuff I put into it yet. So normally it should show up here somewhere. I don't know why it isn't doing it right away. Don't you have to package the file in IntelliJ? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I think it should copy it over. Maybe I should have to package it. I don't mind. Often I'm already also running the, to be totally sure, often I just run the command locally in the, in the container also. I did not uh, uh, prepare um, DSpace to package it, uh, IntelliJ to package it, so I don't know if it will work. Well, it's like um, command shift F9, I think. Yeah, but I have to run it on the, on the pound project, you know? No, no, you, it, I, I think it just has to, like, you change the source folder, now you have oh, okay. to compile it to the target folder. Okay, I don't know. I have to check this out. So what I'm also working on after I saw uh, Andreas, uh, Shanta, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get this working with JRevel. I still have some problems working with it. Um, I'm in contact with the JRevel support. That's something I'm still missing. Um, but you, you, um, you used it. I saw in your image that you're using the DKVM. Um, so I, um, I want to look into it. I want to compare to JRevel once I have it running and decide which I'm going to use. I started from the uh, from the Docker image that I found in DSpace Labs, DSpace Dev Docker, that was there before Terry and I and others started to, to work on the DSpace Docker images. 
And this one has, uh, um, has this included already. So the hot swap agent and the, uh, what was his name? Uh, CV. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean. This virtual machine. <laughs> I didn't have the time to look into it, how it's working. I want to find it out. And I think it's prepared already. So it's really interesting for me. I just. It, it, it does the same as JRebel, I think. It's just free. I yeah. think it potentially does the same as JRebel. Yeah. I will take a look on this. This is not working yet. This is what I'm working on. Kicked off by the show and tell. So they're really useful and really moving things and bringing things forward. But for the moment, I'm already glad just with the setup to be able to spin up my Docker uh, containers really fast to, to be able to have clean environments when I need them, to be able to freeze them and put them aside if I have to switch projects. That's what my main use case is for the moment. So this one ran, we can try reload, to reload this one. No, not there. Hello. I don't know what's not coming. But no, it's there, no? It says hello, Doc. Yeah. yeah, of course. There it is. Thank you. Yeah. So this is the point. Bringing, bringing, bringing new classes, new JSP files into the running container where I'm still working on. So that's why I'm pushing this a little bit to the side for this demonstration. Um, I want to have, have the time to take a closer look to JRebel and the other virtual machine that is for free and running. And um, that's why I'm, why I'm not want to deal with this in this presentation for the moment. But just to see how to get really simple uh, DSpace running, just a container where you have just to put in the Maven and start the container, that's, that's what I wanted to demonstrate for now. What is really helpful also is to take a look at the aliases. So, and in the bash history that I put into the Docker file, I will push this um, for sure to, to GitHub. I don't know when exactly, but it will come. Because um, for example, So what I, what I use here, locks, I think that's clear that what I demonstrated already, it's, it's part of the aliases. It's just starting a tail on Catalina out and on the DSpace lock of the actual date. Sometimes if you're working late, you have to interrupt the tail and restart it if it's after midnight, but um, that works really great. Um, here is a Maven test, for example, as an alias that is, uh, is, is running the tests if, 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 you, if you want to run them. Normally I'm, I'm running, most of the time it's also test currently because I don't have JRebel um, in, in place. Um, what I put also into the command line is, 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 is a command line that is connecting all the commands I need to freshly install the DSpace. So I can kick it off the Maven runs for, I don't know, three, four minutes, the uh, Ant runs, and uh, I grab a cup of coffee, coffee or I can, can make a little break or I do something else and I come back and the, the uh, freshly installed DSpace is running. What I also included is a command to create the, 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 the administrator. So things that helps me to really spin up fast my machine and the command I'm running most of the time is Tomcat stop, then running Maven. If that was successful, one task update, I will say to task in a minute something, Tomcat start and then task clean. And what task does is just running ant but telling ant to run in the DSpace installer directory. So I can run it from everywhere in my system. I don't have to change into the DSpace install directory. And pretty much as this worked really to give this, um, to, was not about done by myself. It was really done in this um, DSpace dev docker by P. Marone. I don't know who it is. If, if you are P. Marone, just send me an email. I would be, would be glad to, to get in contact with you. That was really helpful and really helped me to get uh, right away started and I really want to update this one and we should move it to the other location. Any other questions? Um, was there a reason why you're storing your Docker file um, next to the source code of these space? So the, my Docker file is not next to the source code. I have a symbolic link to my source code. So I have a Git this, that is basically a Git where, I, where, I'm, where I'm working in my Docker file. So mm -hmm. if I change something in Docker, I put it to Git and that helps me a lot. Git is great for everything, also for Docker files. And um, what you see is the DSpace source file is uh, 
just a symbolic link to some other other folder, and I can also change the, the symbolic link to some other DSpace source code folder if I want to. Um, in the Docker ignore file, there should be the DSpace build directory, DSpace source, and the PG data included. Yes, exactly. So um, I'm not running it directly. I'm, I'm, I'm putting the, the Docker file into Git because if you have more than only the Docker file, even if you only have the Docker file, but at the point where you start to work with Docker Compose, where you're putting configuration files into it, that's the moment where you really don't want to work with OutKit anymore. Because I think it would make sense to, um, to give the image a name and then um, go to any DSpace source directory and say, okay, and now yeah. you start yeah. the image name. I... Yeah, so what probably, yeah, so um, I don't know if it's possible. Yes, so what, what would be great if, if we could change the Docker Compose file by environment variables on the host system. So for example, you can use this image as it is without my DSpace source. You would just have to create a symbolic link on your machine or copy your DSpace source code over there. Or you have to change the, the volumes in the Docker Compose file. So here, for example, there's also again this uh, DSpace source mentioned. And if you change this path to some, some place else, um, you can use a, another DSpace source code folder. Yeah, and it would I then and I think we can skip the build step, then you just say, okay, run the image DSpace dev, yes. pull yes. it from the Docker Hub, and then Yeah, and you would just have to run the Maven and the unfront step. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's what Terry and I and others, and I would invite you to 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 be part of this work in the DSpace labs, uh, DSpace Docker images, exactly things like this. So that we have, for example, one image that runs also the Maven and Unstep for you and just is taking some default DSpace. Um, maybe we even are able to include an environment variable that tells the version of DSpace you want to run, for example. Or maybe we, we find some way that you can include your own DSpace source code and that still the build script runs it for you, uh, it wraps it for you, something like this, I don't know. Um, for example, in the DSpace Tomcat and in the DSpace Dev, we should have the, the thing focused for developers. And DSpace Angular, I think that's something that I built last week in the DSpace 7 Sprint. Um, and I suspect that DSpace Angular right now is just a placeholder. I, I don't know that, I can't remember that I actually had an image to um, push up. But the, um, the hope here is anything we um, add to this repository in, in Git will also publish to Docker Hub and make sure we've at least got the right amount of minimal documentation to help someone get going. Well, Pascal, thank you so much for, uh, You're welcome. for putting this together. And we, we've got a second part. Um, Tom's going to talk about uh, testing Oracle with uh, DSpace. But I wanted to give a quick opportunity, um, just if folks want to introduce um, who they are. Uh, no, it's optional, but uh, I'm Terry Brady from Georgetown. If uh, folks want to just kind of go through and say a quick hello. So uh, I'm Pascal Becker from the library code and I just made this presentation and thank you for listening to it. This is Tom. Um, I'm Tom Desaire from uh, Admire and I will tell something about I'm uh, running an Oracle database in Docker. And this is Tim Donahue from uh, Duraspace. Um, and I just want to say thanks, Pascal, for that, that overview. I'm definitely going to have to dig into Docker here after open repositories. This is Bill Kelm from Alama University. And this is just great to watch, guys. Thank you. OK, great. Well, at this point, uh, let's uh, shift over to uh, Tom. We'll talk about. Uh, Docker and Oracle with DSpace. Okay. Um, let me quickly check. Um, can you see the presentation? I can. Okay. Um, so most of the things um, what Docker can do um, were already explained by Pascal. Um, but what I'm going to explain you is how you can um, run an Oracle database in a Docker container and then connect it to your local Tomcat. So the only um, thing I will be running in Docker for now is the Oracle database. Um, 
we've developed this because we had issues with setting up Oracle databases locally on our machines. Um, and this helped a lot to, um, yeah, in developing for this space um, with or for clients that use an Oracle database. Um, the image that I'm going to use is on the Docker Hub. So I'm not going to show the Docker file. You can see it there. Um, I'm just going to show you what commands you have to run after installing Docker on your machine to um, get the Oracle database up and running. Um, I'm also not going to use Docker Compose here because I'm only um, managing one container. Um, so the command is relatively short. It's still, yeah, it's pretty long. Um, but since it's only one container, it's doable. The, the GitHub repository behind this image already also contains some um, utility scripts that can help you to start and stop and reset your database. Um, so the first thing you have to run um, to get this database up and running is a Docker run. And then similar to what you saw with Pascal is that the minus D um, tells Docker to a start this process in the background. Um, then we map the ports um, from the container to our host system so we can access it. Um, so other processes like Tomcat or like the command line um, can access the database on the same host. Um, and then we also mount a volume directory um, so that we persist our data um, from the Oracle database. That's not mandatory, but it makes it easy if you, um, sometimes the Oracle image, the Oracle container um, goes to an inconsistent state or refuses to start or to stop. Um, so then you can just remove it and you just rerun it with the same data directory and it will pick up the data that's there and um, uh, you can continue from there. It's also um, useful to um, move data between developers. Like, okay, we have a specific issue in Oracle, so we prepare a data set and then we copy that data directory to, um, to the machines of other developers and they just start the Oracle database with the same command and it will pick up the data directory and um, reuse that data. Another important part here is that we, um, we give the container a name so that um, we're able to uh, manipulate it later. And then at the end of the command, you have the image that you want to start. So for now, um, it has been a while since I've updated this image. So it's still on the um, version 11 of the Oracle database. I know there is already a version 12 now. Um, but I did not have the chance yet to, um, to update, to release an image version for the 12. So um, to explain a bit more about Docker image names, like the first part at, at, at the admire here is the, the organization in which the image can be found. Then you have the DSpace Oracle, which is the image name itself. And then behind the, uh, the column, you have a version. Um, so we can maintain an, an 11 G2 version and we can also release a 12 G1 version later and they can evolve independently. Um, then it does take a while for this database to start up. Um, and there is a script running um, when the container starts that checks if the database is ready to use and you have to wait until you see that. So let's quickly, I started it. Uh, I started a few minutes ago. So if we check with Docker logs, you get like the, the console output of a process of a container that started in the background. If you don't use a minus D, you will see, um, you will see the, the output rolling over your screen, but it does block your terminal at that, at that point. Um, so here it says um, database ready to use, and then it outputted some more things. Um, so now I have a an Oracle database running um, on the port, um, on the uh, typical D Oracle D space, uh, database port. What the, um, the image also does is it creates the DSpace user with a default DSpace password. 
um, and also make sure that the DSpace user has all the necessary permissions in Oracle to create tables and views um, and records. Um, the next step is that like, then you have to tell DSpace, okay, um, use Oracle as a database. So these are the typical properties um, in local.gfg that you have to modify um, to connect with Oracle. An important one here is the db.schema. Um, it has to be the same as your username. That's something um, typical in Oracle. And um, yeah, by default, the user is created with a DSpace password. You can see here that my Tomcat will be just connecting to local host, just like if you would run a Postgres database on your local machine. Um, so for Tomcat doesn't know that it's, it's talking to Docker. Um, so we can try this. Oh. So here you can see that the local.cfc is configured um, to, with these properties. So now if I start my Tomcat, which is just a, um, a local Tomcat instance, which does not run in Docker, no, that was too quick. Okay, let's just. My IntelliJ doesn't want to play nice today. Go again. Okay, while well, this is starting. Um, some other useful commands is to, um, you can stop the database, which is just like, you just stop the Oracle database process. It does not remove the container itself. It just stops it. And it also, also does not remove the data. It's just to, um, yeah, if you don't need the database anymore, it's best to just stop it and free up your RAM memory. Um, then if you decide later, hey, I want to, reuse that um, Oracle database again, you can, you can play with the names here. Like for instance, if we, um, we have multiple clients running an Oracle database, so it would be typically like the client name dash Oracle. Um, then I start that instance again, and you don't have to re-execute the run command. It still remembers which data directories have to be linked to that container. So it will find the same data directory and it will, um, use the same data. And then if you want to start over again, just with a clean database, um, there is a utility script for this in the GitHub repository, but to give you the full explanation, like the first thing you have to do is um, actually stop the process so that it's not running. And then you have to remove the container, like clean up any of the, um, yeah, it's not a virtual machine, but the contained process also creates some log files and so, so it, if you remove the container, all those log files will be created. But it will not automatically remove any linked volumes. So you do have to remove explicitly like the, in this case, our data directory, since we, be, we gave it an explicit mount point. Um, and then you have a full reset. So if this, Is still not running. Connection with me. Okay, I'll give it another go. No, now it's now it's running or trying to run, yeah. Okay, now it's going. But then, yeah, once you've um, once you've started the, the the Docker image, it's just like a local database. It does, you can even um, use IntelliJ to connect to it, and then you can. Uh, yeah, now it's empty because I just created it, so. 
Um, Flyway did not run yet. And I have to give a password. So yeah, this makes it easy to, um, to test Flyway scripts on Oracle or to test um, specific Hibernate things with Oracle. Um, but it's not recommended to um, use this image for production purposes because we've noticed that it, it's not always super stable. If you um, yeah, start and stop it a lot, it, it gets to a state where it's doing nothing anymore. So you have to completely throw away the container and, and build a new one. But that, yeah, it goes very fast um, with Docker. Are there any questions already while we're waiting for Tom? So Tom, as you build different database images, do you always like essentially build an, an empty database and then repopulate content? Or do you ever sort of baseline your uh, database image with some, you know, a collection hierarchy and some items like some content already loaded? Um, what we sometimes do is like we have some database dumps that we can use, that we import once the database is running. Okay. Um, but they are not really part of the Docker image. <clears throat> so one of the design principles of a Docker image um, should be that all your state has to be outside of the image. Yes. Um, so for example, uh, data that you put in your database should not be part of your uh, container so that you can just remove containers and, re and recreate them again and continue from there on so that all state is outside your containers. Okay. So that makes yeah, sense. I, think, I think I've been kind of curious about is could, could you ever like have a, a baseline database and asset store with some really interesting use cases already built and kind of just from, you know, from the start have content ready to be used and tested. Yeah, you could then the image, yeah, the image is now already quite large. It's still around 400 megabytes. Um, but yeah, like we could um, create these page, create some communities and collections, then create an Oracle export, the, an, an Oracle database dump and put that in a directory. And then we would, we could modify the, the, the moment where Oracle starts, like, hey, any file in that directory, import it after you've started, so that once the database has been completely started, it would um, it would already contain some data. So that I think the the problem also we have is that if you put something on a on a bind mount or on a, in a volume, so something at a place where it is persisted. It is not accessible at the build time. The image is built at a moment and on a, on a machine where you cannot expect that it runs over there, it can be transferred to another machine and runs there. So the volumes and bind mounts are not accessible at build time. So it will be hard to create an image that puts out a D space that contains already content and is still in a way you would create it to be used in a productive environment. If we have an if you want to create an image that is really only for demonstration purposes that gets lost when the container is thrown away, then we could do what you were asking for, Terry. Okay. It seems like another option would be to do something like you were showing Pascal in terms of creating aliases and stuff and also um, basically almost having like a set of AIPs um, on your local machine so that after the image gets built, then you could just run an alias that would import those AIPs yeah. um, through DSpace and then put yeah. them into either Postgres or Oracle. Yes, it would be something like demo.dspace.org, like yeah, just yeah. yeah, yeah. So it seems like it's possible. We just have to build that into these into the DSpace Docker image, probably as as like an alias of some sort. I want to say thank you to Tom because uh, a year ago your Oracle stuff really really helped me a lot when I was chasing, chasing a, a bug in DSpace and was had to write some uh, some flyway scripts to to put a put a put a bug fix out to DSpace. So your Oracle stuff was really really helpful to me. 
and um, it was great to be able just to spin it off and to get an an official Oracle installation with some test uh, license without having to look around and to register and to do awful things. So thanks a lot for providing this. Yeah, no problem. That's what we're using it also for. <laughs> because Oracle does make it difficult sometimes to <laughs> yes. manage. It's yeah. not the most easy database. I'm not sure why my Tomcat doesn't want to start at the moment. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think you'll have to believe me that it actually starts. <laughs> I was able to run it. And maybe also you were demonstrating something that I've got to demonstrate is that you really can connect to the services your Docker containers are running. I showed my, display, my Tomcat running. I didn't show my PostgreSQL and to connect to it. So you can include it into your IntelliJ like Tom did and, and showed here. You can also, um, in my case, normally I'm, I'm running PostgreSQL and you can also access this one with PG admin or I yeah. IntelliJ or whatever. Well, Tom, there... uh, no, thank you. Thank you so much for um, for putting these demos together. This is uh, this is um, really empowering to know that these technologies exist. I, I think of how much harder my development processes have been uh, in seeing what what's possible. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I wanted to jump in and just ask: Is there plans to move this into the DSpace Docker images that Oracle? Yeah, I, um, I have to check with um, at Meyer, um, but I don't think there is any, um, yeah, there will be any objections to move this to another repository and to like to deprecate our repository. And what I'll do, I'll, I'll kind of on our, our page for the meeting today, I'll put a link to that repository and just a reminder that we've got the DSpace Docker channel in uh, Slack. So I would just say, as you've got stuff that you think is a good candidate, we can start a conversation there where we have we don't we haven't developed really rigorous approval processes yet. I think it's um, there are two of us right now or three of us who can publish to Docker Hub, but we're certainly open to expanding that um, just as long as we we kind of come up with our set of minimal documentation we want to have for any new images that we um, make available. And everything I showed, I will make available also, but I'm, I, I just ask for a little patience because I'm totally swamped till the week after open repositories. There's too much work currently going on to contribute the stuff already now. I will do yeah, it I suspect uh, we all by are. end of June <laughs> or early July. Yeah, so suspect we're all a little uh, swamped with, with that coming up. Um, I am curious, I we've just got a couple minutes here. Two Two questions I have, one is, so we looked at Oracle as sort of a, a Docker service that that's you know useful to package separately. Can you all think of any other companion services that would be helpful? Like, could Shibboleth be deployed as a Docker, like a test Shibboleth instance? Would would that be appropriate as a to run as a Docker container? I don't know the test shibboleth environment that is out there. I know that it exists, but I didn't look on it. Um, depending on if it's fine for them and, and if they have some kind of stable status you can use, then yes, of course. Yeah, shibboleth already does have a test shib environment if you go to testshib.org. Okay, now, so you know we don't even we wouldn't even need a, a Docker image for that. No, you can you can test everything against testship.org. They have a full test environment there that I've used in the past to debug shibboleth issues and it seemed like it worked fine. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't try and push for shibboleth specifically. Okay. But but it seems very likely like um, like Pascal had mentioned it'd be nice to be able to have like an image that spins up like the DSpace 7 REST API and then a separate one that has uh, Angular spun up in it, um, separate from the REST API and things of that nature are pretty obvious wins. Yeah, great. And the, and the other the other quite thing I have is just, I, I created a wiki page at our, our landing page for the show and tells. If folks have any ideas for future topics, we have a date at the end of June arranged, kind of figuring that'll be after the open repository conference. I threw a couple ideas out there. I think Pascal one I had seen you had you had suggested in Slack last week. Um, I threw that on there and then I, I added one about uh, spring, just a sort of a general overview. But anyway, um, throw your ideas up and we'll uh, be happy to plan uh, some other future topics. 
And Tim, thank you in advance for uh, for uh, doing the recording for us and getting that online. I know it'll be helpful for people who weren't able to attend today. Yeah, definitely, no problem. And thank you for organizing, Terry, and thanks to Pascal and Tom for presenting. Yeah, definitely. All right, have a good day, everyone. Bye, all. Well, it's my pleasure. Goodbye.